We've all heard sayings about, you know, embrace your Goliath. Absolutely not. Um, that wasn't David's mentality, and it shouldn't be ours. As a matter of fact, we have somewhere down the line lost that mentality. In today's society, David would have been asked to pray for Goliath. Told him to be inclusive. Told him to use safe words. And by all means, make sure you use the correct pronouns. Well, we're going to get your adverbs, adjectives, and your pronouns all wrong today. So today in a society where masculinity is deemed toxic and chivalry deemed as discrimination and in fact chauvinistic. Man, it is too late to wake the sheep. It is time to wake the other lions. Micah coins a phrase that says that uh, meekness is not weakness. We'll go a little bit further into that. I believe that as a Christian, uh, meekness is a virtue. However, it is not a virtue unless you are capable of violence. Men, we are supposed to be monsters, but we're supposed to control it. That's where meekness becomes a virtue, is when you have the capability of doing something that you know you could do and you know that you normally would do, doesn't mean that you should. That's something we have to control as men. There are too many boys being raised in this church and in this country. The reason is, is because we got boys raising boys. <clears throat> I have two daughters. I'm not saying that I am the pillar of what a man should look like, but they're going to be able to recognize the difference. So I encourage you as men, raise men and raise godly men. So we use this story so much as a metaphor. You know, anytime we're facing problems that we can't handle on our own, we coin the phrase facing our giants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lindsay prayed for cough drops. Amen. <clears throat> um, I am obviously not feeling well. Um, I'll try to get you guys through this. I normally do. Anyway, this may be a little bit shorter than normal. And on top of that, Wednesday is warrior group. So y'all get to talk about it. And this is the second time that Harp has done this to me. So y'all can blame him for this. I think he does it on purpose. He doesn't want anything that he says be remembered, uh, especially a week later. But he's on vacation this week, so uh, we weren't praying for him. We were just praying for safe travels. Um, but anyway, so before I, when I did this message the first time, I asked my youngest, Carlin, that, you know, who Goliath was. You know, and she's grown up in Sunday school and church, and without a bat, she never even skipped a beat. She said that's the, the giant that David killed. And so we're going to kind of describe what this giant actually looked like. Uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel <clears throat> 17. I'm not going to read it all. When you get there, shout amen. We're going to start in verse 4. So verse 4 through 7 says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over six cubits and a span. He had a, broad, a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze, weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs he wore <clears throat> bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. <clears throat> so David's Goliath was tangible. It was something that he could physically see. This man is standing right in front of him. So six cubits and a span, in some of y'all's translations, equals nine feet, nine inches tall. Bronze mail or armor, like chain mail, like knights used to wear, weighed 5,000 shekels, which equals about 125 pounds. The tip of his spear alone, 600 shekels, equals 15 pounds. Y'all, that's a bowling ball. The tip of his spear weighed as much as a bowling ball. So our Goliaths are much different. They don't prance around the hills of Ella, much like Goliath did. They don't carry swords or shields. They carry weapons of health problems. 
unemployment, family issues, financial problems. They're up close and personal. They're in our home, they're in our offices, they're in our kids' classrooms, and yes, they are in our church. We know our Goliath, we see his face, we know his voice, but when faced with that giant, is Goliath all we see and all we hear? We have to bring David's mentality back. And what David did is he saw beyond his giant. We're going to jump to verse 26. It says, David asked the men standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I'm going to repeat that what he asked. What will be done? So in the verse prior to that, we know that there is a reward. I mean, verse 25 clearly tells us that. It says, now the Israelites have been saying, you see how this man keeps coming out. He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. So if this was anyone other than David... I would say that he is, in fact, asking about the reward. But however, since it's David, he wanted to know who this uncircumcised Philistine defying the armies of the living God was. His living God. Here's another phrase that Harp so eloquently coined around here. It says, David doesn't show up with confidence. He shows up with Godfidence. And the reason he could do that, we'll jump down to verse 45 through 47. It says, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it was not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, but the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. We are never alone. David knew he wasn't alone. Our giants, however, ultimately, if you don't face them, they will overcome us. We know we don't have to face them alone, but our focus has to be on God, plain and simple. So when we look back on this passage, that's exactly where David's focus was. So first, I want you to think about how much he dwelled on Goliath. Only two times is Goliath mentioned, and it's not even by name. So in verse 26, it says, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Down in 36, it says, Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. So in this passage, there's no, there's no questions about Goliath's age, capabilities, intelligence, no concerns even about his weapons. No concern by the weight of the spear, which would be very concerning to me. I just described how much that weighed. The size of his shield, the strength of his armor. David didn't know how big Goliath was because he already knew how big his God was. God, on the other hand, is mentioned roughly eight to nine times. Just real quick, 26 and 36 says the armies of the living God. Verse 45 says, The Lord Almighty, the God of, Ar God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46 says, The Lord will deliver you into my hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The Lord does not, verse 47 says, The Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So God's focus outnumbers Goliath by over four to one. Four to one. So ask you a couple of questions. Do you think of God's grace four times as much as your own guilt? 
Is your list of blessings four times as long as your list of complaints? Where is your focus? Well, to be like David, you have to be God-focused. That David's mentality, he remains focused on God. It's not that he doesn't see the problem. I mean, how could you miss a nine-foot, nine-inch giant? But he sees God more than he sees Goliath. He sees God in, God in all of his glory, all of his wisdom, and all the resources he has behind him. In fact, in the previous verse that I read, he's already praising him for the victory before he even goes into battle. And David runs to the problem and not away from it. There's an analogy we use here between cows and buffaloes and how when a storm's coming, they can sense it. Uh, a cow runs away from it and it spends more time in that storm. A buffalo, you've seen them, they're just covered in snow. They just look like a hot mess. They've ran into it. If you run into your storm, you're going to spend less time in it. <clears throat> so the question was, that man, you, you say, but I'm not David. I'm not like him. Aren't you? Here's just a few things about David. So I want you to listen and kind of compare if you think you're not like David. Despite his shortcomings, David was a man after God's heart. He fell as often as he stood, stumbled as often as he conquered, stared down Goliath, yet lusted after Bathsheba, led armies, couldn't manage his own family, had eight wives, and through all that, he had one God. Again, some of you may say, but I'm not David. I'll tell you, you know, it's easy to describe us when we think about characters in the Bible, about who people say, oh, well, you remind me of Peter, or you remind me of him. And for us to say, oh, well, I remind myself of David, those are pretty big shoes. Um, I don't compare myself to King David. I compare, there's a, a story in scripture where David's wife is sitting up in the window looking out at him and she sees him dance around the street naked. I'm not, that's not where I'm going with this here. <clears throat> but that perception, his wife is basically like, man, look at this fool. But what she doesn't know is that he's praising God. Yeah, he's naked and he's in the middle of the street, but he's praising God. Sometimes your vulnerability is just that. You're naked and you're praising God because that's all you can do. And other people look at you like, man, dude, it's crazy. <laughs> that's a fact. That's a fact. Uh, <clears throat> so I've told you a little bit about David. Um, I'll tell you a little about me for a minute. I'll get to you here in a second. Uh, if you're a guest here with us, uh, I'm going to show you just a brief glimpse into what church leadership looks like here. Uh, <clears throat> so some of my Goliaths were grades I couldn't make, bills I couldn't pay, and people I couldn't please. I'm talking about me, remember, I haven't got to you yet. Drinks I shouldn't have drank, drugs I shouldn't have taken. Women I shouldn't have chased, bars I shouldn't have closed down, which led to a failed marriage. I'm talking about me, remember, I haven't got to you yet. A pastor that hurt me, a church that denied me, pornography. I'm talking about me. I'll get to you in a minute. Fear, doubt, worry, anxiety, depression, I haven't even got to you yet. All this because I had a past I couldn't escape, which led to a future that I didn't want to face. Some of you say, man, you've done all that. You're not qualified. You are 100% right. I'd agree with you. We've even had somebody on social media says, you and Micah are no better than the sinners in your congregation. Amen. That's right. 
Don't you dare put us on a pedestal. If Micah feels the same way, I'm not going to speak for him, but sitting under that man, I would rather follow somebody that's anointed and not appointed. So welcome to Christian Warriors Church, if that's what you're looking for. If you're not, we'll help you find a church that you can belong to. Um, me, a little personal story about I can tell you the day, the place, the time when God himself reached into my chest and sewed up my broken heart. Matter of fact, me and uh, Leroy gave a message on a Wednesday night that was called uh, Head Knowledge versus Heart Knowledge. <clears throat> How he and I started off on very different paths where he had the head knowledge. It was nine years ago that I finally surrendered to Christ. And even though our path started off different, we met at the same place. Because where he had the head knowledge, I automatically, I had no choice but to start with the heart knowledge. Once you get to that point, your life has to change. You have no choice. Paul couldn't go back to being Saul even if he wanted to. We have to get to there. So now, let's talk about you. Oh. You can participate if you want. I don't care. I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyway. How many of you have experienced just one of those things that I mentioned? Look around. Look around. And some of you think God can't use you. Some of you have told yourself that. For some of you, you are your own Goliath. Goliath is anything that prevents us from walking out God's will in our lives. David needed Goliath. If it wasn't for Goliath, David would still be herding sheep. So when you're faced with your Goliath, you don't reason with it. This is what people don't talk about. We're going to finish out in verse 51. It says, David ran and stood over him. It says he took out the Philistine's sword. He took his own sword, drew it from the scabbard, after he killed him, he cut off his head. You don't reason with it. You kill it. You cut off his head. <clears throat> so there's four little things that I kind of, they're not takeaways yet. Um, I do want to mention a couple of things. Is, is Goliath, your Goliath, our Goliath can be found anywhere. At home, lurking on the internet, hiding in a bottle sitting at a desk next to you, laying in the bed next to you. You can conquer your Goliath, and you don't need five stones like Scripture said. You just need one. That stone has a name, and his name is Jesus. He is there to lift you up, support you, and carry you through things that you can't walk through by yourself. <clears throat> Some of you are going through a situation where you can find no good. You can't find the good in the physical. You have to go into the spiritual. I always, I always miss Don's not here so I can run him over with the bus. I always mess with Don when he starts talking about the spiritual world and I think of young guns when Chavez gives them all peyote. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And Billy the Kid asks him, he's like, why ain't they trying to kill us? And he goes, because we're in the spirit world, butthole that can't see us. <laughs> you have to go there. You have to get to that place. In my earthly mind, you can wrap your head around no good. I'm obviously walking through something. There's actually several of us walking through that right now. Um, there's good that I can't see in the physical realm. So if you're going through something similar, I got a question, maybe even just a statement. Maybe you're the good that God's trying to show other people. Maybe God's trying to shine through you. See, no one pays attention to the warrior until the enemy's at the gate. And then it's all eyes on you. They want to see what your demeanor is. They want to see what you're thinking. They want to know where you're at, where you stand. God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. He's going to send you through hell just so you can get to heaven. 
So in those moments, do you have a tribe that you can reach out to? Do you have a church? Do you have a group of people that are going to pray for you even when they don't know what it is they're praying for? If you don't have that, it's time to find it. Jesus himself fell down carrying his own cross. 